everybody. I'm Kukatlet Klawan Petki Hunnane Tanaha. My name is Beverly O'Neill, and I am coming to you today from the unceded traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh people based down here in downtown Vancouver. So really happy that you could you could join us. Today we have a few wonderful speakers. This session is is actually coordinated with Canadian Agriculture and Human Resources Resources Canada. Itself, um, we've got the these. This is the first of a five speaker series on agriculture and, and foods for Indigenous people. It's a national speaker series, open to anyone to attend. Really glad that you're able to make it. It's, it's coordinated through the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council. And in each of these five sessions, we have uh, co sponsors itself, Indigenous organizations. But today, it is First Nations Agriculture Association of British Columbia. Trevor, give everybody a wave. He's the representative from, from that organization. First Nations Agriculture Association of BC started way back in the 80s, first as Western Indian Agriculture Producers Association and have expanded its services over over the years. So um, we will hear more about First Nations Agriculture Association in a moment. Just a little bit uh, about what our program program is, uh, and then I'll give you an uh, introduction to our speakers today itself. Uh, just a reminder here, the session is being recorded. It, it's just a speaker session until we get to the questions and answer, uh, answer spot in the program. With this video recording, Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council is going to be editing it, and then they'll be posting clips from this session and the other four sessions onto its website. So um, if you wanted to return and, and hear some of the key points that some people have shared with the groups, uh, please join CARC later on in early 2022 to see those, to see those clips itself. Uh, we uh, will be having a dialogue today on, on, and the topic today is on community agriculture and gardening. This is this has become increasingly important in this incredibly strange and weird weird world that we're living in, in with the pandemic. And um, while food security has always been important to our community communities. It's been, and oh, by the way, I uh, ask for your apology, but I'm probably gonna be throwing in a bunch of puns in there. Food security has been of growing importance to our communities and our people. Um, many of our communities have, have, uh, have expanded into this field. There's pun number two in less than a minute. And it, they've expanded into this field and we're gonna hear more about green housing and community gardens itself. Um, our speakers today are Trevor Kemp Thorne from First Nations Agricultural Association of BC. Trevor, give everybody a wave again. Um, yeah, yeah, just as he was drinking coffee. We've got Derek Hastings from Trondike Heishen um, First Nation, and that's in Dawson City. Uh, but there, he's going to be speaking about their greenhouse and their gardens and how and uh, how they got started and how that's changed. Derek, give everybody a wave. Thanks, Derek. And our third our third speaker is Leon Hunter, and he's with Métis Crossing. It's about an hour and a half north of Edmonton, and uh, they've not only got uh, gardens that they that that they um, connect into the tourism attraction called Métis Crossing, but they've also got some new partnerships and some expansions there. Every uh, Leon, give everybody a wave from from you. And that's a picture of picture in the background of Métis Crossing itself. And near the end of the session today, we have um, right after the uh, the uh, conversation we have with them, then we're going to have a question and answer opportunity for you to ask questions for the people listening on the other end. Feel free to add questions in the chat. That'll be the easiest way for us as the panelists to see them. And then we'll, um, uh, and we may be able to take some, some live questions itself. Then we've got agency summary and recommendations. So with that, we've got Matt the favor he's with agriculture agri-foods can canada so matt give everybody a wave great thanks and we will have online also jesse robson and jesse is with farm credit credit canada um we have uh we'll be going over what our next sessions is as well um we'll be doing prize draws at the end so the indigenous participants you'll be eligible to win one of three 100 dollars draws you must be in attendance to win that draw to to win um, so when we get to the part where we're doing the prize draws, we're just going to ask you to take yourself off mute so that if your name is called, just yell so we know you're there. And if we don't hear anybody yelling, then we will be 
doing another draw. So I have left our one, um, two people off from introducing them because they get to be your first speakers. Um, one is Aaron Bryson. If Aaron, you want to give everybody a wave. Aaron is your technical person. He's also the one that you need to be most nice to because Aaron's the one that sets up the draw and he'll be pushing the buttons for that. He's your technical person. He's also the person that has set up the registration. So if you have any question on registration, um, please let him know. Aaron, by the way, um, uh, also, um, if, you, uh, if you're registering for the sessions, feel free to share the link to other people you might know who are interested, who may be interested in attending these sessions. And then finally, our next person is Jade Reeves. Jade, give everybody a wave. Jade hey, is with Canadian. Hey, hey, everyone. Jade is with Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council, and she's just going to give you give us an overview on what CARC, CARC actually does. Uh, by the way, also feel free to um, let us know that you're there by sending a, a quick greeting in the chat session and saying, hi, I'm so and so from such and such. One of the things we want to get out of this session is um, having you connect with other people from across the country. This is a national session. We have people joining us from Atlantic Canada, from from the from the territories, from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, Quebec, all across all across Canada. So this is a great opportunity for you to start to build your network. And the wonderful thing about about this these Zoom sessions is that we're all able to join from across Canada. So, um, Jade, take it away. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're so pleased to have you join us, and uh, look forward to to being able to share in the next. Um, five sessions and, and hopefully move on in the future and really collect some feedback from you as participants about what you'd like to see moving forward and how we could, you know, uh, CARC could be um, a connector to help develop a network and, and, and have these sharing sessions continue into the future. So um, we are a not-for-profit organization that um, focuses on HR resource, uh, human resource needs in the industry and we cover all commodities but i'm pretty sure you're most of you who have joined are quite familiar with the uh the council so i won't spend too much time talking about it but would happy be happy to share information after after this session but one of the things we do need some help with is we have developed national occupational standards and there's a picture here and it's by role so we've done that for uh the laborer, worker, supervisor, and manager roles. So we have four different standards for each commodity. So for example, honey production, apiary, um, that you see on your screen, we have four roles there. And what we were hopeful to do was to make sure we could have those shared with the group to be able to have people view and provide comment on where we could add or change information to make sure Indigenous practices are included in the information. So. Um, Beverly will be sharing that in, in Word docs, um, or I can as well, uh, after the fact. But if you have a keen interest, that would be amazing. Please let us know through the comments and we'll make sure to connect with you. We have them across all commodities. Um, so I just, it's just a picture, but we have 16 different commodity groups. So I'm quite certain we'll have one that might be of interest to you. So let me know if you would like more information about that and I will, I'll make sure to get in touch with you. Thank you. Great, thanks everybody. So I've, I've introduced our, our speakers itself. I'm wondering if each of our speakers, um, I, well, we start with Leon, if you'd like to do a quick introduction, then we'll go to Derek, then to Trevor, and Trevor then is going to speak on the First Nations Agriculture Association. So Leon, a quick introduction of yourself. Hello everybody, my name is Leon Hunter and I'm the manager here at Métis Crossing. I'm speaking to you today from Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, Métis Crossing started as an initiative of the Métis Nation of Alberta about uh, 20 years ago and they were looking, the leadership of the Métis Nation was looking for a place to call their own as a place to celebrate and share their culture. And um, the, the phase one of Métis, Nation, of Métis Crossing opened uh, in the August of 2005. Um, recently, phase two began with the construction of the Cultural Gathering Centre and now we're nearly completed phase three, which is the uh, establishment of a, of a lodge, so a hardtop accommodation. 
uh, as all this stuff is going on, there's other um, really interesting opportunities developing, most notably for this presentation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is the um, development of the um, agritourism element of our of our business. So that includes traditional gardens, um, food forests, um, a bison herd, and also permaculture installations as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Great. Thanks, Leon. Derek? Hi, my name is Derek Hastings. I uh, currently manage the uh, Toronto Kitchen Teaching and Working Farm in Dawson City, Yukon. Uh, it was an, uh, um, initially um, a, a farm school and there was a, a pilot project for a couple of years um, to develop a curriculum and to uh, you know have a cohort that uh, would learn different elements of agriculture and it's it's morphed over the years uh, into uh, more of a working uh, farm with practical education whereas we have developed micro enterprises some agricultural tourism and community community events at the site but we also are involved in building infrastructure to help in food sovereignty, food security in Dawson, and we we try to work with the other farmers in the in the area here to uh, just make a more robust agricultural community and have that food available to uh, the Toronto citizens. So uh, this project's been in development for about eight years. Uh, it came out of uh, a situation where as the road was cut off and access to food was limited. So a lot of the uh, First Nation uh, folks at Trondic and, and the, specifically the elders uh, developed this idea to utilize the um, unused land that they had acquired during their land claims agreements uh, with, the, with the federal government. So uh, yeah, it's going really well and we can discuss the details of what we're doing uh, later on. Thanks, Derek. And I'm um, going to ask if uh, Trevor Kemp Thorne of First Nations Agriculture Association of BC, you can introduce yourself and tell us about First Nations Agriculture Association. Thanks, Beverly. Uh, my name is Trevor and uh, I work with First Nations Agriculture Association and uh, I first started to work with these guys back in 1985. So I've been around this for a while. Uh, First Nations Agriculture Association is a, a member-driven organization. Uh, we have uh, producers from all regions of the province, really, uh, and, and projects that are ongoing. Uh, we provide uh, program services primarily to producers uh, for financial planning, our business planning. We help advocate on their behalf with uh, government and, and provide any number of services. We have a lot of information on our website that uh, helps producers if they're looking for information. Uh, this last year, I mean, just dealing with the wildfires and, and that situation, we were able to download some information that came from AgSafe in the province of BC for our producers to uh, study. Um, and we take, um, questions and uh, from all areas of the agriculture industry, whether it's primary or processing as well. So I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Well, when Trevor, when we say, you know, the, today's topic is on community gardens. Can you sort of share with, with the panel as the rest of the audience, um, how a community might get started if they were to connect with First Nations agriculture? How would you set up a garden? Okay, so we actually have a, a, a checklist that we put together. During, during the start of COVID, we ran into some, some uh, situations and it had been going on long before that. And, and so I had discussions with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and uh, Eric Nietzsche, I, I know Eric is on the call today, uh, went back and she developed a checklist for setting up say greenhouses, which also works for setting up your gardens. That's the primary fundamentals. And so that's something that we recommend to everybody. And I sit down, I like to go through that checklist. Uh, Lorna Shooter, who's on our board of directors also developed uh, the, another checklist or 
uh, the process that you would need to go through to set up your gardens. So um, we were running into a lot of this simply because communities did not have that expertise or knowledge uh, when they went out and started building these. And, and we had great examples. We had greenhouses that were built with a hydroponic system put in and no water accessible to them. You know, just uh, it's almost criminal when you have consultants that do that kind of work. We had other greenhouses that were actually built in amongst the trees for shelter, but no, no light because the trees had shaded them out. So those were concerns. And we see that happen with the gardens as well. So there are a number of things on that list that, that they need to address. Um, but the best thing to do is, is just start with a conversation and we try and figure out what the needs are and what the goals are uh, to get started and, and then we go from there and the, the lists are just there to help them. The list, the list given to me a, sh, uh, a general framework and then it's tailored to the needs of the community itself. Yeah I, I always it's 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 up to them what they want and we then we try and and, and uh, meet those needs. Sometimes uh, what they're asking for isn't is impossible and you need to be able to to explain that to them so they can understand it's an, and it's unfortunate in some situations, but it's better that they know than rather have someone come in and just have them, you know, provide them with a business plan or, or a feasibility study that says they can do it when it's not really possible. So Trevor, what conditions might make it not possible? Water. Okay. Water's number one, I think. Yeah. Um, water and sunlight were two of the issues that we ran into in many instances. and. Uh, and then also there are other issues with the climate and it could be uh, selecting a location. I had one, uh, one community that wanted to put uh, their gardens fairly high up on, a, on the mountains because mm -hmm. that land was free. The band said, you can go up there and put in your gardens, but uh, they obviously wouldn't survive. I mean, it would be difficult for a greenhouse to survive given the winds finding, in that in an area finding like the right that. look finding the right location with the right climatic conditions and having the, the resources there whether it's water and or if it's electricity that's needed to operate some sort of an energy source to operate the greenhouses or, or a number of conditions that are essential yes yeah okay. thanks trevor that's that's a good segue into into um conversation with derek derek you're in yukon Dawson City, where it's gets what my up to minus 40 sometimes like Dawson City I was checking out the temperature. And um, I mean, you look really bundled up at, at this moment at this moment, but the temperature in Dawson City can range from what uh, uh, minus 28 up to 23 and, and sometimes it gets down to minus 43. I, I remember when I was in Dawson City, and they were talking about the dog track or, or the group of people that put together a hockey team in the early 1900s and went to Ottawa and vied for the Stanley Cup that they were dog sledding to Whitehorse in minus 50. So how does a greenhouse survive in, in those temperatures? Tell us how it got started. And um, I understand you also are now selling to the public. So tell us more. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just lazy. That's why I don't take my coveralls <laughs> off. Here. I just leave them off. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I look all bundled up just because I didn't take it off. But um, yeah, it does, get, it does get cold. We're lucky these days. Well, lucky and it's challenging in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the climate's uh, warming, changing, you know, it's uh, how that impacts the wildlife, how that impacts people's ability to cross rivers and whatnot. And the snowfall uh, is changing, the amount of precipitation is changing. So yeah, the, the climate is warming, uh, which some people have suggested that there'll be a benefit to agriculture in Yukon. So that's something we try to take advantage of and adapt to. Uh, you know, we, the, the project started with a, with a pretty grand vision for this, this, uh, this greenhouse that would be a four season greenhouse. And it's gone through a number of iterations. Like uh, we've initially worked with the Yukon College Cold Climate uh, Institute. A and it was essentially a 30 by 120 foot 
uh, greenhouse with a solar, like a solar south face mm -hmm. uh, poly surface. And then it would just um, be utilizing biomass to heat it. And then we, we couldn't get the funds available at that time. That was four, that was five years ago. We could, we had the idea, we had the basic design, but we couldn't get the million dollars that it cost uh, to build it. And, and the Trondic uh, First Nation was not, um, was not, not interested in uh, investing at that time or didn't have the available money. So we, uh, we kept working on it and we uh, got some funding through uh, the Arctic Inspiration Prize. Uh, we got nominated by Sandy Silver, who's the premier. And we developed the nomination package with Yukon College uh, as partners. And we got 500,000 through the Arctic Inspiration Prize. And then we got another 500,000 through um, the Climate Change Adaptation Funding, federal funding. And so at that point we had a million dollars and uh, it was 2019 and we started working on it, but uh, you know, looking at the long-term goals of the Toronto First Nation for the farm, well, a major focus has been uh, financial sustainability. So a greenhouse, like you suggest, how do you operate a greenhouse at minus 50 and make it not drain the bank account, right? just from just heating costs and whatnot and just labor costs so we really had to go back to the drawing board and look at the design it still utilized the south facing poly uh panels and that uh sort of passive solar heating uh in the in the shoulder seasons but we had to really look at the costs associated with heat sinks and the costs associated with how large it was going to be and the lack of sort of utility rooms associated with this greenhouse. It was just a greenhouse, mm -hmm. it was just an area to grow. We didn't have any areas to take what we've grown and turn it into something or have the people who are gonna be part of this greenhouse operations actually involved in like a teaching environment, which has always been the goal of the farm. It, it requires more patience than I have most days, but it's like it is it is a teaching environment it is a learning environment so we're all sort of young farmers whether we're 20 years old or whether we're 65 years old we're all just learning together so essentially we built into the idea of the greenhouse uh, a commercial environment where we could take the products and make value added uh value added um products you know take the take the vegetables make value added products but also have a space where we could teach uh, canning and preserving and smoking and butchering and uh, a number of other um, parts that we felt were important. Uh, and if you had a year round heated space, why not utilize this space to um, take the products from the greenhouse, turn them into something, offer those workshops, and that would also compensate for the cost of growing the vegetables so that your vegetables it wouldn't amount to like $10 a tomato or something outrageous that would that wouldn't contribute to food security for the for the people that need it it would just contribute to greater food security for the wealthy class which is which is a part of the issue with northern agriculture especially in our situation it costs so much to produce the uh the unit the uh, the product that a lot of our product if we don't work within the government uh the th government's distribution systems then we have to charge uh, such a high amount that it doesn't get to the people that we want it to get to. So it's, uh, yeah, it's ongoing. It's an ongoing. Affordability, affordability yeah. is incredibly important in, in, your, in your design of your, of your greenhouse, not only to keep the operating costs down, but to ensure that what you're growing is accessible to the people, to the, to the people in the area, not just for the wealthy. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> having the workshops available to all people in the Yukon, specifically though to the people of, of Trondequichin First Nation so that they have that winter time to develop skills that in the summer they'll feel comfortable engaging in agriculture, engaging in gardening, engaging with seed starting. Because a lot of it's like if you set people up to fail, they get disheartened and they leave. And uh, if you have the time in the winter to really go into detailed educational experiences where, you know, seed starting, you can take a whole week and really get into seed selection and why and how and all the different materials 
and not have to do it in a commercial environment. Whereas, you know, efficiency is key to reducing cost. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I think it's going to amount to a stronger agriculture community plus um, hopefully be financially sustainable, which is the long-term goal. Super. Thanks. Thanks, Derek. Uh, I want to go on to Leon because I, I love that you were talking about, look, we're also going to be, we're also focusing on ensuring that people develop and build their knowledge as well in, in the center. And that's one of the things I saw when we were developing this last year on, on what's going on in Canada and in Indigenous agriculture and what uh, initiatives have emerged. And I, I, I really love what's happening on happening at Métis Crossing because it brings together uh, traditional agricultural knowledge, Métis culture, and shares it through a public setting in, in, in the Métis Crossing attraction. So Leanne, tell us more. You, you did a bit of an introduction, but um, what is going on there? Like, how did you identify what to grow and what cultural aspects are you incorporating into it? Yeah, thank you, Beverly. Um, so when you visit a cultural site like Métis Crossing, um, you know, one of those universally identifiable elements that gives people access to all cultures, I think is through food. And, um, you know, based on the different cultural nuances, there's gonna be a different relationship to that food. Um, at Métis Crossing here, um, the, the Victoria settlement area, which we're located within, it's a traditional Métis area. Um, it was first established as a um, sort of between the fur trade era ending and the um, agrarian sedentary style of life um, emerging. So we're actually located on river lot titles that predate the province. Um, and so that transition between, um, you know, fur trapping or subsistence hunting and um, a mixed farming approach uh, is part of what we try to capture when we're doing our historical cultural interpretation. And one of the ways that we share that story is through demonstration gardens that are within our um, heritage village or historical village area. So when we're looking at what do we grow in those er in those uh, gardens, we wanted to try to establish um, species of plants that are, you know, would have been actually grown by those, by those Mét early Métis families when they moved here from Red River. So, um, you know, we talked, spoke with elders and we did some research and we identified heritage varieties of vegetables and our experience development coordinated a really good job of sourcing those seeds. So she, um, you know, scoured the internet for, you know, heir heirloom seed producers and we got specific varieties of, of beans and squash and, and different vegetables that would have been grown at that time. And there's some really, really interesting um, types of, of vegetables that, you know, we just don't necessarily see anymore or, you know, they're kind of a little bit rare. So we really try to dedicate a por portion of our garden to those, um, those areas. The step beyond that, or another step there is our permaculture garden. So we have an area that um, uh, really tries to, to uh, prolong the approach to gardening, which is permaculture. So that's, you know, living kind of in harmony with, with the nature that's there, um, employing passive systems, whether it's uh, through ir passive irrigation systems uh, or, or, you know, locating the garden in a sunny, sunny area. So we actually, through doing that, we, we identified, I think, four or five permaculture sites that we've established, and they can, they vary in purposes. One is, you know, a shelter belt to prevent the north, the northwestern winds from, um, you know, hitting certain parts of the site. Another part is dealt with um, mainly dealing with the uh, runoff of water from the gathering center. We, you know, put in this gathering center, the engineers were like, oh yeah, it'll just feed into this pool here and then drain off down the river bank into the river. Well, before I think the building was even completed, we realized that that approach was actually washing out the access road to the, to the, uh, to the river. So the road was eroding because all the water was just shooting straight down the hill. Our permaculture advisor comes in, he says, well, this is a great source of water. We slowed the water down um, through uh, various pools and um, on contour uh, swales. And then within those those uh, earth structures, we started planting different mm. uh, species. Some of them are, um, you know, trees, and then others of them are actually food bearing um, plants. So we're taking advantage of um, irrigation water that would be running off of our structures and putting them into a uh, into a garden situation. So it's uh, sustaining the it's helping with the watering. 
uh, of there. And so, so the permaculture sites are really, really interesting because they, there's a different approach to, um, you know, gardening um, involving, you know, sustainability, working with what's already there and, um, and, and different principles there. So that's another interesting element that we have. Um, the other element I want to talk about is the food forest that we have established here. And um, we probably picked the worst year um, in the last five to establish it because we were under very severe drought here in Alberta. But we planted uh, 2,500 um, Haskat berries and 2,000 Saskatoon berries. And we did that. Um, the Saskatoon is very much an indigenous species to this area, lots of cultural um, uh, significance, and it's a really hardy bush uh, to, to grow. And the Haskap is a little bit different. It's it's a similar berry in, in appearance and taste, but it's more of a located from, it, it comes originally from Japan. And um, we planted this one because I think that there's a potential, really good potential, future potential for it. It has a high in nutrients, a very hardy bush as well. And, um, you know, it could be one of these, one of these super, it could be considered a superfood. So we have these two berries um, that are, you know, take up, I think roughly, six acres of production and we planted them very much within that commercial approach um, and and all of these attend, um, um, gardens and whether it's you know sort of the the more interpretive scale or the commercial scale mm -hmm. all of it is there to support telling of the metis story and ideally be worked into a culinary element at the site so a lot of what we use currently can be worked integrated into the um, culinary operation there. And the, you know, the, the intention, the desire is to be there in a real um, commercial scale so that it can be very much um, applied in a meaningful way there. So that even the excess that we're processing, turning into jams and then selling it at our retail location mm -hmm. or even further, you know, distributing it beyond the borders of Métis crossing. Um, but, you know, it, it is a process to get there. And so we've, you know, I think we're within the first two years of establishing the food forests. And um, I mean, some of the heritage gardens have been established earlier than that, but you know, to get to a place where it's um, commercially viable, I think it's a little bit of a journey to get there. And, you know, we kind of like to try to do things in manageable steps and already the 2000, 4,000 um, berries, you know, like I said, planting them within a, a drought year like this, we've provided its own set of challenges. So you kind of really quickly see the hidden costs of scaling up your business into a into a uh, commercial venture, and you know you just try to um, learn learn from what's gone on and and make good steps in the future. So so we did consult. Yeah. So you know deciding what to do, we consulted and uh, what grows best in that area. So yeah, and what I'm hearing from all three of you guys is like you really need to know what your what what your land capability is and, and and that includes the whole entire the whole entire climate so Lynn, you were talking about you you've done some mid and some long-term planning in there Derek one of the things I remember you you saying in an earlier conversation was that when the pandemic hit new opportunities emerged tell us about some of those like how did that come about and how did you how did you navigate that there is the third the third pun how did you navigate that field in that climate well yeah it's people inherently i think are reactionary right so they don't pre they don't prepare uh you know for um situations like the pandemic so the pandemic then all of a sudden there's questionable distribution issues and uh food uh the the chain of uh distribution uh is uh, not secure not as secure as before so people instantly believe you know get into the mode well I'm going to start a garden. I want to preserve my own foods. I want to grow my own chickens. I want to do a number of things that they might not have done. Plus there was a lot of time because people were at home more often. They were working from home. They were self-isolating. Yukon had these self-isolating uh, situations, two weeks if you were out of territory and then if you exhibited symptoms or it was two weeks. So it, like in that initial, Mm -hmm. you six months of the pandemic or at least when it started to get acknowledged and really people started to prepare for uh the the coming winters needs they yeah they there was a lot of people who needed soils they needed inputs for starting 
whether it was uh, feed or chicks or eggs to incubate, uh, any number of things we sold that year that we usually don't sell to that quantity. And this year was a little bit less, but the trend has definitely stabilized. Like there, it's not it's not the quanti same quantity of people getting uh, soil, say, because mm -hmm. they built their they built all their boxes last year, so they don't need as much soil, you know. So this year they bought some amendments like manures or whatnot. Uh, so you saw an opportunity there because people started coming to you looking for what you said soils and what else was there that all of a sudden people are getting into gardening. Yeah, gardening and and animal production too, like uh, like just even just little meat birds. We had an, uh, like people piggybacking because we order a substantial amount where they're brought in the uh, the Cornish cross meat birds from you know a, a hatchery, and so it helps to have a distributor in town because each it's it's a logistic challenge getting them here before they die. Like they only have a couple of days. Uh, mm -hmm on the a on the yolk you know that they consume during the hatch and so if we can bring them all in and then distribute them we become not just a farm that is uh engaged in community development but like mm -hmm. it's actually uh helping uh address some of the the needs uh that that there's no private solution to mm -hmm. so that's always been the challenge is how to navigate where we don't impact the private sector because we are funded by the, the Toronto government. So there's that, it's a tightrope, you know, like we don't want to impact other private producers because they've paid for this farm independently and we are doing it uh, with government money. But at the same time, a lot of the, the, the problems exist up here because of uh, the high costs. And if we can help bring those costs down by, by, uh, you know, doing it yeah. uh, in bulk, you know, having, having that available product. So we've, we've found a niche there. So, so being aware of what else is in your area so that you can work together and complement because there's nothing gained by, by, um, by, by competing directly with, with others, with others. It's working about building a, a larger area. Um, I just wanted to say, we've got Harold Eljam. Harold, if you can take yourself off a uh, video, put yourself on video so we can see who you are. Harold is the president of the First Nations Agriculture Association. So Harold, give everybody a wave. So he he and Trevor work closely together. Um, we've got a question here from Joanne Ross. Uh, Joanne Ross is with Treaty 2 in Manitoba. And she was asking um, uh, Trevor slash Harold, um, she's, in an agri agri she's with Agriculture in the Classroom Canada and uh, was looking to see do you see an opportunity an interest or a capacity in your area to bring in classroom gardening programs to the local first nation schools uh why don't we go with harold because harold you're yeah. with uh with the band yeah. yeah yeah i um there's always an opportunity uh to to fit in i guess to start the children on getting the interest of growing something you know, where they see just a seed when they planted it and, and uh, what could grow. Um, and we've had it at our, our First Nation school uh, and they had a grew, grew to a point where they grew a garden outside, you know, uh, watermelons and, and pumpkins and things like that. And it, which is awesome for the kids that, that spent the time to nurture the plants weeding right uh mm -hmm. you know to to see it actually grow and for them to be able to take it home um and hoping i guess trying to create that uh maybe they'll grow a garden at home mm -hmm. no matter how small it is but they could see uh we had people growing uh jalapeno peppers and things like that which is it's fairly it's fairly hard to because our weather fluctuates so much, um, you got to be able to protect them until they're they're pretty hardy, and and things like that. So it, it makes the difference where you are in in our valley. If you're up at Douglas Lake or in, in a sheltered areas, you know, and but also to understand this heat dome they called that we had uh, many. Many gardens did not grow. They almost drive, 
dried up and shriveled up. And never, and never mind the uh, the notice we got. Uh, we're in drought for for a situation, so no more irrigating. What? You know. <laughs> so, so there, there's a little bit of a pun there. Yeah. So, irrigating with irrigation, right? Irritating right. irrigation. So, yeah. So, so that's so. You, so, you guys have been doing it, and the, the the chance for kids to bring home something they grew is is quite rewarding. It sounds. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. where so, you got to start. I think start with I the really, kids. Yeah, that's where you got to start. Yeah, which is something that, that with uh, Leon with Métis with Métis Crossing. Do you guys get a lot of kids there? The kids there with families? Well, obviously they're not coming by their own because they can't drive. But tell us what is it like there? Do you have experiences tailored to families and kids? Yeah, uh, one of our largest um, visitor segments is the educational market. Um, we. And that's the one nice thing actually about our mm -hmm. gathering center it allows us to welcome those uh, school students year round as a, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's a development. Um, and we see a lot, a lot of kids coming through and um, whether it's through educate intentional educational programs or through um, families coming to visit uh, that story of, you know, the, the, the garden to the plate or the uh, farm to the, to the grocery store, element of it is definitely something that um, we, fe we feel we find that, um, you know, teachers and students are looking for, um, mm -hmm. even in an agricultural community, um, there's some there that we find there can be a lot of disconnect between, um, you know, the process of, of how our food gets created and, and get, gets to us in a, at the end, at the end result. So yeah, we definitely see a lot of interest in that. And, um, you know, and also, the other side of it is, you know, sharing the indigenous relationship to food production. Our elder does a really good job of, um, you know, working, you know, tales from the buffalo hunt as to, you know, what does that mean culturally significant for the Métis people, and then also, um, you know, the relationship there between, you know, even the, the forms of government and the based based on um, on the buffalo hunt, and so that's always kind of been connected there. Um, the development of the food source. And including, um, you know, those 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 significance, the cultural significance of, of certain animals and, and ways of life. Like um, it's not always um, cultivated, right? Mm -hmm. There's also a um, a, uh, a gathering side of it, harvesting from the land, wild crafting element that um, that is involved in the food production too. So I know that you know sort of the Western perception of relationship to the land or demonstrating ownership of a land is through a use case scenario with somebody having an agricultural impact on it. Well, a lot of the um, uh, Indigenous peoples from around here, you know, their relationship to the land doesn't necessarily demonstrate um, um, agricultural use through it. It can be through other ways, such as um, wild crafting or, you know, hunting the wild animals that exist on that. So that, that relationship to land can be unique. And that's one element that we always try to make sure we uh, share and talk about when we are welcoming youth to our uh, site as well. I really love that you brought in that, you know, the connection between our cultures, our traditions, values, and how we how we relate to that to the land itself. We've got Jade with a question here, and then I'm going to go to some of the questions we've got in, in the chat. And by the way, that was a, that Leon, thank you for bringing that up because one of the questions was um, how how can we share information and make the public more aware of Indigenous teachings about gardening and, and farming? And are there any web pages that any of you can suggest on First Nations agriculture, Indigenous teachings, and traditional foods itself? So I'm gonna I'm going to um, actually ask you if anyone of the panelists or uh, panelists and that includes like Matt or Matt or Jesse um, if you have an answer to that and then um, and then we'll go to Jade's question so Matt you raised your hand yeah well, I would just say quickly I mean it would be we have not seen a resource like that that sort of centralizes that kind of information but what we have seen are pockets and initiatives that are cropping up in different regions where they have you know, elders who are working with, um, you know, uh, you know, teaching farms like like Derek's and otherwise, mm -hmm. and they're bringing people in to, to to kind of reclaim practices and get you know folks back or or um, get them the information on how things used to be done. Um, so we are seeing more and more of that happen, and I feel like if you know this is just an emerging kind of thing, but there there will be some 
uh, you know, additional kind of repositories of information or, or, you know, centers where people can go to get that info. And it'll be groups like this where we can then distribute it and say, hey, you know, you know, you've got BC's checklist, but we've also got this list of, you know, practices or, or people who know about the practices. So that's an area where we're really keen to kind of keep an eye on. Yeah, so a sort of a source, a source that brings this knowledge together is, is quite needed. In a couple of the sessions, in a couple of sessions from now, we've got Pierre Worm, who's going to be speaking. He's been with an, an initiative for National Indigenous Agriculture, and Dale's been around for, for geez, I met him like in 1999, and he'd been with agricultural for for at least a decade before that. Um, so uh, the, the questions we have online are actually are a lot to do with how do we bring this dialogue of Indigenous cultural teachings into the agricultural production and, and how can um, others um, not a part of the community, the, the non-Indigenous community, how can that knowledge be, um, how can we merge that knowledge and have the right conversation with the right dialogue. So um, Jesse, you've taken yourself off Zoom and then we're gonna go to Jade. Yeah, and I think that's a great question and something that we've been looking at at FCC here. And we have begun, we're in the early stages of trying to create something with other industry partners and indigenous uh, industry to create um, kind of like a, a center, we're calling it kind of like a circle of excellence where we have all sorts of knowledge, all sorts of financing information, but not just the financing, but you know the traditional knowledge, as well as practical farm knowledge, you know business knowledge, kind of create something where industry can come together and have uh, this sort of central hub for for anybody who's interested, whether it's business or farms or food companies, where they can come in and find this out. Now, something like that, it's a really big undertaking, and so it takes a while to build momentum on that. And mm -hmm. so we're, we are in the early stages of that for sure, but uh, we're hoping we can create something that can fill that need. Okay, great. Thanks, Jesse. Let's go to Jade. Jade, you had raised your hand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a couple points, but that's a, that's great to hear, Jesse. And um, that is something that we've collected feedback on in past uh, focus groups and consultations. And uh, we've seen a need for developing a community of practice um, for the Indigenous community. And, and CARC does want to be able to, to go in that direction, to be able to provide a platform or um, facilitated, certainly um, with the expertise of the subject matter experts that are joining us over these sessions with Beverly's help. Um, but great to, to know that that's underway. We certainly don't want to reinvent the wheel so we can work together perhaps to, to help facilitate that. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was that uh, Leon and Derek have made some great points around the training and the teachings um, within their operations. And um, I just kind of wanted to circle back quickly to the National Occupational Standards because I know it was, you know, a very brief introduction and I thought it would be best to connect with you individually by email, but, but really that's what those documents are for. They, they encompass all of the tasks required to be proficient within a role with, on, on a farm whether that's gardening, whether that's honey production, whether that's livestock. It, so each one of those pieces really kind of gives you the what you need to do, not the how and the why. That, that would need to be facilitated through developing training. But because we have these standards and they have been developed with producers across the country, what we thought was we need to make sure that we collect your feedback. The Indigenous uh, lens has not been applied and I think it's important that we collect that and include those practices uh, to your point Leon you know some of those those cultural practices are not necessarily the westernized uh, agriculture but but the they should be included because they are more than than um, than what we've got and this will enrich our document so so we really, really hope that we can get that participation. And I hope that kind of clarifies a little bit what this is, because I think these, these um, tools will be really helpful to the industry as we move forward in um, food sustainability and in egg practices. So. 
Oh, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, we've got not, uh, that, um, look, we've got some foundational documents and it's sort of like what Trevor had mentioned in his first comment when I asked about, when we talked about the great, um, the community gardens, there are some standards, some, some checklists available out there and they just give you a place to start. They give you a place to start. For those of you that asked in the chat, um, can we get those links? There were links posted by Matt and by, uh, um, by Erica from BC on on what that checklist on what that checklist is. Harold Aljam has just posted his email in there too, so he's he's also available um, to connect with from First Nations Agriculture Association of BC. But I mean, the question here, the question is, is like, how can we incorporate more of these Indigenous voices? And Jay just said, look, we've got some standards here. Let's make sure we put apply an Indigenous lens to those sta those standards. But um, are there other ways to any of the panelists, are there other ways you can see that, how can we ensure that that cultural knowledge, those values, those principles, how can we incorporate that into community community gardens and, uh, and help our communities gain more food security? Trevor. Yeah, Beverly, actually it happens a lot in, in uh, community gardens or community projects in BC. Uh, Elders are always brought in to share their knowledge, especially with the youth um, when we have them. Uh, and a lot of times, like Leon, there's there's an incorporation into the, those gardens of uh, traditional plants, and and so that teachings teachings can be done right there at the gardens um, uh, where there's other people that will take them into the hills or the mountains to, to do the wild harvesting and get the youth to understand it as well. So it's ongoing, but it changes from every region in this province. So I don't know, I mean, it might be a little simpler to do something like this on the prairies where your climate is, is more consistent, I guess. But in BC, I mean, it's vastly different from the Kootenays to the caribou, I mean, you're talking entirely different climates and, and uh, traditions and culture. So, yeah, Atlantic Canada that, as well. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen Derek and Leon, you mentioned too, it's the building in permacultures. I just wanted to mention in one of the partic participants um, in this session, she, she's uh, in the participant category is, is Paulette Flamont. Paulette too is doing um, permaculture, Leon, in, in um, I think it's Fort. St. John area. So yeah, Fort St. John area. So you've got we've got a few people, Indigenous people here um, with with that knowledge and that's building building it up. Um, other suggestions, Derek, how did you, you mentioned in your comment that the gar the greenhouse had had your elders blessing and direction and input into it. So how can we incorporate more Indigenous knowledge into our agricultural practices? Well, uh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard for me to definitively say how how to incorporate, but what I can say I can speak to what I've observed as okay. the, like a sort of an evolution over the five years I've worked at the TH farm is that um, you know it seems to we built we built housing here initially to house the cohort that was taking the farm school, and over the years the housing has changed to to sort of have people uh, on site that were house homeless essentially, or wanted to take an opportunity to have a cheaper uh, reason, a housing alt like opportunity. And now it's become like a site sometimes potentially to, for people to come and uh, be free of the town, you know, and its elements and different, just a place for people to established an uh, identity outside of um, the modern, uh, you know, social environments that tend to lead people down a self-destructive path. That's specifically in Dawson City, we have that uh, problem here. Uh, so having a space that has become more of like a, a living uh, space where people interact as their, their home outside of outside of, uh, you know, the town has created it, it, like those associations with back to the land and the identity of how to, 
how to relate to the land and create a, a greater uh, connection going <laughs> forward. And sometimes the, the greater the connection, then the more responsible as a steward people become. So like there is a lot of wildcrafting as people suggested. <laughs> there is a lot of uh, discussion as how to do this effectively in a permaculture way, um, how to utilize what we're taking and not just waste, be wasteful with a lot of the agriculture development in the Yukon is incredibly wasteful. They just take vast quantities of land, push all the trees into giant piles and burn them in the atmosphere just out of regular practice. This is like best practices for a commercial mm -hmm. agricultural development. So the way we're env envisioning our development is the, through the use of animal uh, husbandry to sort of change the land from forest to garden, but utilize the wood and how heating homes and utilize the wood through mulching and chipping to give back to the organic, uh, like the organic fertility of the soil. Try to make it a well-rounded, I think that's the, I think that's where the indigenous knowledge cut, where it's a, a well-rounded holistic approach to development as opposed to this sort of blazing through conquering and then leaving you know uh what is what is commercially productive but not in any way uh, resembling the the original um the original landscape so we've tried i think that's the best way to incorporate uh indigenous knowledge into agriculture from my observation is and also the youth being available to work with the uh, the elders at the same time mm -hmm. and share that experience and develop their own form of education, their own form of uh, uh, relationships in regards to agricultural knowledge, how, what that looks like to those individuals and how, how the elders will instill that knowledge in the youth. We're finding that it's just naturally happening as people are on site and are, are here for long periods of time. Some of the longest uh, people at the farm are six years now. Mm -hmm. a, a younger man from wow. 12 to 18 and an elder now that's going into 65 start at 59 to 65 so we're they're developing their own relationships and uh yeah and then i guess uh, as well as how we can potentially bring in uh aquaponic or like a, a hatchery we discussed earlier then that would help incorporate or help rejuvenate the uh, the lost um, stock, like salmon stock, which is an important important thing as well to, to you know keep those uh, wild stocks in place. And an important aspect of of the culture and in, in the indigenous people's culture in the area. Okay, hey, um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists if you would like to make one final comment. I would say, what advice do you have to to other Indigenous people and, and First Nations across uh, across Canada and how they could get into community gardening. One quick piece of it, advice. Um, um, Matt, you have your hand up, so. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think just back to the last question about yeah. bringing in Indigenous knowledge. Um, you know, one thing that we have seen is just, you know, actively going out and seeking the perspectives, you know, and the knowledge of elders um, is, a, is a really a good practice and we're trying to do that at agriculture and agriculture canada we've done in cases like you know the um uh, container um greenhouse in joe haven and things like that but it's just you know having that mindset is, is a really important thing to, to start and to kick things off and then you can build that relationship like derek pointed out so i just wanted to quickly just mention that yeah there's there's amazing there's lots and lots of of success stories now out there all across canada um, that you can learn from them. I like to call it wise ways because it's it, it worked for them. It may help you. It may help guide you and your community on on finding a solution that works for you. So I'm going to return to our question here. Um, it's like uh, one quick piece of advice to give to uh, our audience out there, and then we're going to go into um, Jade has a, has some things she needs to say about Kark, and we've got um, Egg Canada with Matt and Farm Credit Canada with Jesse. Uh, talking about some of the programs and then we'll be doing our draws and introducing you guys to what's coming next week and the week after and week after and week after so why don't we start with Derek then we'll go with Leon um, Harold and Tr and Trevor uh, for one quick piece of advice a uh, piece of advice is uh, when like uh, I think Trevor mentioned earlier is yeah uh, planning is essential and growing to your 
your strengths. Um, I think uh, I really like what Leon was talking about with the bison. That sounds like amazing. Something I'd definitely visit and I'd tell, let people know that are going near there to visit. And I think it's, yeah, I think growing to your strengths, you know, don't, don't try to grow tropical fruit in the, you know, uh, even though, you, you know, it might seem like really a great idea because everybody wants corn maybe it's better to grow cold crops so that you have the success initially. And then when you develop greater infrastructure and, and uh, you know, more knowledge in agriculture, then develop some, uh, try, challenge yourself with, with more of the har uh, harder to grow crops, because that's what we mostly do. We just grow the easy stuff, grow the easy stuff. Okay, Leon. Um, I think that one of the keys for establishing um, a community garden is, you know, do what you do best and then partner for the rest. So if you have a specialty or an opportunity to do something, um, you know, do it to the best of your abilities. If it's something that you need to get to, in order to take it to the next level, I would recommend looking for a partner. Um, yeah. Just, you know, like our bison ranch here, you know, we have a lot of tourism experience at our organization. We didn't have a lot of bison um, uh, ranch experience so we partnered with our neighbor and now our friend um, and you know and he's able to bring that ranching experience so we can put the bison back on their traditional lands here at Meiji Crossing so um, you know think about what you can do and then find a partner to be able to do what uh, whatever you can't do internally it's my recommendation. Great, great, thanks. So um, know your own strengths and look for expertise to fill in those gaps so partner. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Um, we're going to go to Harold and then Trevor. Um, what uh, quick piece of advice do you have to First Nations and Indigenous people? I guess my suggestion is uh, to understand that it, it starts probably in April for our area mm -hmm. to planning a garden, but the planning starts last fall of what you're going to do. And it does take a year. Um, you can't sit around in, in August and say, geez, I'm going to do a garden. You're too late. Yeah. You got to wait till next year. And so to understand those things, and because I've, I've seen many, many have tried and many have failed because of that. They're, they're out of time with, and that's the thing. You can't change that season. You can't change mm -hmm. it. So you got to work with it um, to get the students, children, interested to grow something uh i was talking to a to a a, a guy that's running a greenhouse and he says geez uh, i don't think i'm gonna grow to cucumbers mm -hmm. it takes a lot of room in your greenhouse even though they grow well but he said then they're only selling for 50 cents each so you know if you could grow it outside do it outside where you got more area yeah, and that's and that's the uh, and that's the the uh, gift of working with someone who has that knowledge and experience. Like, where would you grow the cucumbers? You yeah. don't grow them in the most valuable space. They yeah, grow very well right. outside. Grow them outside. They understand okay. the cost of operation of that space. Yeah, I would excellent. think. And with Great, that, thanks, uh, you'll be successful. Thank you, Harold. And one last comment from Trevor. Then we're going to go to go to. Um, uh, Jade, then to Matt and Jesse for overviews of those programs. So Trevor, your final comment. So, and I was just looking at, at uh, Derek and Leon and the obvious thing is that you have to have a champion to run this project for you. And without it, they don't succeed in it. As Harold Ball knows, we, we have people that run very successful operations, but it's because we have that champion in the community to ensure that it moves forward. And they're, that's their focus is to take care of that. The other part of it is it, it needs to be a sustainable su sustainable business enterprise mm -hmm. for them. And there are a number of ways you can do that. Um, we're happy to discuss that later, but that's the two key components that they need, that champion, and it needs to be a sustainable project. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Trevor. So build on your build on your successes by by knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, not just with your with your natural environment, but also what you have knowledge of doing. Um, establish partnerships, connect with those people with the expertise and make sure they have expertise in your area and what you want to do, because someone located in in Toronto 
doesn't necessarily know what the climate is like um, in um, St. Albert or, or further north of, of Edmonton or, or what it's like in, in Halifax or, or in Chilliwack in terms of the climate, what is the water conditions like? So, so build on that expertise. So I'm now going to uh, bring it back over to our friend, um, our friend Jade, and um, she's gonna give you a little introduction here to the wage subsidy program that Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Canada has. So there you go, Jade. And then we're going to go to Matthew and then to Jesse, and then we'll do um, draws. So Jade, here you go. Okay, great. Thank you, Beverly. Um, yeah, so this is a great opportunity. We're really excited about it. It's a, um, a student workplace placement uh, program and there is a wage subsidy opportunity as you can see up to 7500 in wage subsidy per student um, and an employer can hire more than one student so it's it's per um per employee that you would get that subsidy for um, but the students do need to be enrolled in a post-secondary program that includes a work placement requirement and it's open to all sectors across agriculture um, and positions, you know, could could range from um, on farm work to even accounting, equipment maintenance, communications, business planning, finance, marketing, etc. So um, the link that is on the slide provides more information. It's a portal. So as an employer, you can go get more eligibility criteria. You can um, it's pretty, pretty well done the portal. But if you do have questions, we're happy to help. Um, my colleague Nadi Imran, if, runs this but I can certainly make the uh, connection and uh, and and help you out if you're interested so okay so this this one runs from September 1st so it's it's open now and yeah. uh, closes at the end of, at the end of March so um, as Harold eloquently said it's about planning so get people engaged right now okay so I'm going to turn it over to uh, we've got Matt Lefevre. Um today it's Matt another day it might be Dominic Kelly but today we've got Matt so Matt first and then we'll go to Jesse Robson sure um just quickly um yeah I will highlight that there are some services and um uh you know programs available from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada the first thing I think people would be interested in I'll put in the chat and then is the Indigenous uh, Pathfinder service um and so this is a kind of a, what we have tried to make as a one-stop kind of uh, a shop um, so that Indigenous um, ag uh, clients can, can access uh, information on programs and services that AAFC has. So they're the Pathfinders, and these are actually humans who will, you know, take uh, uh, calls and emails from folks, and they'll help to provide information on, you know, services that are programs that AAFC has. And then also they will provide you know information on programs that we know about that occur in provinces and territories um, with those governments and then also with non-government bodies as well. Um, AFC also has a couple of indigenous um, focus programs um, which we launched in 2018. Um, they are the Indigenous Agriculture Food Systems Initiative um, and that one is now I believe closed um, because it had significant interest um, and the we also have the um, Youth Employment and Skills Program, um, which um, I understand will likely be um, uh, renewed. Um, and it is similar to what we've, we've just heard from our park folks, um, you know, that it provides um, funding for ag uh, internships. Um, and then lastly, we have, it's not Indigenous focused, but it has been accessed by many Indigenous communities, and that's the Local Infrastructure Fund. Um, and it's a $60 million fund that was announced um, about a year and a half ago. Um, and Various iterations of it um, have um, uh, been open. Um, the next, uh, I would say, you know, this is one of those places where folks, if you are looking to start a community garden or otherwise, you know, it was one of those services that was used by Indigenous communities and um, the program has been evolving. So it's something to keep an eye on to see if that opportunity opens up, um, uh, you know, for that. I'll provide the link in the chat again. And um, yeah, that, I, that's good for me. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. So we're gonna to go to Jesse Robson. Yes, hello. And so that slide might look a little intimidating, but I'll break it down for you. That top section, the FCC knowledge we have, those are the sections that if you go to fcc.ca slash knowledge, nice and simple to remember, uh, you can have, <clears throat> you can click on any of those categories. And that's really the basics of 
of the information you need to know. So what FCC does is, you know, we're, we're essentially the a bank for agriculture and food. So we'll finance primary production and we'll finance food and beverage companies. Uh, if you go on to the knowledge website, so those, those first few categories, money and finance, strategy and planning, transition, economics, and then managing people. Uh, if you go into those, uh, you'll see that we have laid out some, some of them are, are seven part series. Some of them is like five part series, but it's essentially the um, business essentials to those topics. And those business essentials, it's really easy to navigate once you're in there. Uh, they, they'll really show you the basics of beginning that business and starting that farm, starting that food company. And those business essentials really tell you all that, that you as a, as a customer would need to know in order to um, begin the process of creating a successful business. And so FCC, we focus our knowledge on the business side and on the strategy side. So earlier in this presentation, um, Trevor was speaking to some of the basics of greenhouse and gardens and you know, location and things like that. Um, and so while our FCC knowledge website doesn't, doesn't really refer to the how-to farm, we focus on the how-to business of, of ag and food. And so when you do deal with our FCC lenders, however, um, actually building relationships with your relationship manager at FCC. They're the ones who do have that information, that knowledge on, on the basics of farming, making sure you have those steps in place and they'll, they would be navigating our customers through that kind of process. And so um, while we, we do have an extensive knowledge side uh, and we're currently working on building out uh, some of the more niche information when it comes to indigenous agriculture. And so we're creating some content. We've, we've done a little bit of that. You can also go to fcc.ca slash indigenous to see how we're curating our content and our lending towards the indigenous audience. And on that note, the bottom half of that slide, you'll see the Aboriginal financial institutions. That's just really a small list. I can paste into the chat here a, uh, Mm -hmm. sort of a more extensive list of Aboriginal financial institutions. And um, those, I think the most important part of that is, is when it comes to community gardens and, and community led uh, food operations, what FCC needs is um, we need to be able to show that there is a plan for repayment capacity. And so uh, sometimes we've had people do guarantees from the band if they're a First Nations community. The guarantees from the band does help in that repayment capacity. Uh, the smallest loan FCC will do is five thousand dollars, and so so that's really on the on the. I think that's that speaks to some of that community garden planning. Um, we do, we have done a lot of greenhouse financing and things like that. So if you contact our lenders. Uh, they will have a lot of information on greenhousing and, and what you need in order to start that kind of business. But I think that's where I'm going to leave it for now. And if there's any questions particular to that information, I can gladly uh, answer. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse and, and Matt. Uh, Aaron has posted into the chat the, the links to these different organizations. And Jesse mentioned he can put in the link to the Aboriginal financial institutions. There is Aboriginal financial institutions all across Canada. In the next couple of days, in the next few sessions, we're going to hear um, from from one of a, from one of them. But usually, if you're not certain where to start, connect with an with an AFC, an Indigenous financial institution, an Aboriginal capital corporation, or a community futures program in your area that's Indigenous led. Farm Canada knows how to link you into those as well as does um, Agriculture, Agri-Foods Canada or your local ministry itself. Um, usually what we do is we start with, um, if you're not certain you start there and, and they should help you to link into these other programs itself. So um, we are um, now in the point where Aaron gets the links ready so we can do the draws on it. Um, I, oh, right here too, the National Aboriginal Capital Corporation Association of Canada, they list the Indigenous financial institutions, plus the community futures organizations and, and community futures and, and some of the uh, IFCs are able to also do, do some business um, workshop training on, on how to do a business plan and things like that. Uh, let's see, a reminder that the session um, as the Q&A has been recorded, the, the speaker series, 
CARC is going to be editing those and putting them on their website. And I'm expecting that probably you'll start to see those in January. Um, so next week we've got the topic is livestock and seafood. And that was great because um, Derek had mentioned, look, they're looking at adding in an aqua aquaponics or an aquaculture side of it. So we've got next week, Marguerite Parker. She's with the Aboriginal Aquaculture Association because aquaculture is more, it, it's for lands as well. So as an inland community, you can also look at what are your opportunities and, and adding some, some uh, fish farming in your, in your inland community. We've got Sonny Gray. He's also from U Yukon for He's doing work with the Natural Nine and First Nation. They've got community agriculture, chickens and animal processing. We get to hear their story on um, um, purchasing a white and a red meat food packaging process. And I, uh, he talked me into chickens too. So, um, and we also have as our co-host next week, Jennifer it is a Sk the Saskatchewan Indian Equity Foundation. Uh, at a, uh, and uh, we've got Jennifer Sutherland speaking uh, uh, from there. The week after we've got production, marketing and packaging. This one, um, by the way, we, we do have the third speaker on that one. Ulnawig, I love their website, you guys. This is an indigenous capital corporation, a, a financial institution. They do business planning and services. Do take a chance to look at their website. It's my favorite um, Aboriginal Capital Corporation financial website in all of, all of Canada. It's got incredibly useful tools in there. So just Google them, you'll love it. So we've got Paul Langdon speaking from there. We've got Mike Randall uh, with the Lennox Island First Nation. Amazing things that they're doing in Atlantic Canada in large production. And our third speaker is actually Jolene Waski. And, and Jolene has a company that packages sir, syrup. Love it, love it, love it. It's natural syrup. It's out of Atlantic Canada and it's got amazing packaging itself. So um, you'll be hearing more from her. Um, week after, we're going to talk about greenhousing with um, uh, co host there's Natural Indigenous Agriculture Association. Association. I mentioned Dale Warren. We've got Stephanie Cook. She is with Abascava Cree Nation. They've got a ver vertical aquaponics greenhouse. Um, uh, just uh, uh, aquaponics, um, how it was designed by the community to first serve the community and the things they're doing. We've also got Jacob Beaton. So he's with Tea Creek Farm. Um, he and his wife sold sold out of the big city and bought a farm. Um, he's from a First Nation community. And uh, over this first year of operating their gardens, they've had over a thousand people come in into it. They do training of youth and community people, um, community gardens and green housing. They do farm management. They've partnered with Industry Training Authority. And they also do biofuels. So if you want to know how to turn turn farm waste into biofuels, Jacob knows how to do that. He's really knowledgeable on soil as well. Um, December 7th, our last session is going to be on traditions, processing, and storage. Our co-host is Makavik Corporation. Um, they uh, are uh, are connected, of course, to Nunavut, located in northern, in northern Quebec. They're going to talk about the Perisuvit project in their, and their cervic food center. Uh, we've got Dawn Tababondang, the First Nations grower. She's really big on, on seed preservation, so that tied in with some of the conversation today. Um, knowledgeable on cultural foods. And E.J. Elmer Fontaine, he's with Cedar Lake Ranch and Amic Inc. They do labor, labor farm lady. Uh, farm labor uh, and restoring uh, indigenous cultures and foods. And he also has a cattle ranch. Um, EJ has been in the agriculture farming business for I'm guessing at least 50 years. So our last session is full of incredible knowledge that's really going to be grounded a lot in, in traditions and culture. Thank you all for attending. Uh, we hope that you've that this time has been worth your while. You've gained a lot of information and as well as, to, as have connected with um, some people you haven't yet connected with. Um, Aaron, I think you're going to be sending out a link to uh, an email to, with uh, links of, of uh, the programs and initiatives that we've heard. And again, we hope we'll see you next week on it. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, stay safe, be kind. And as I like to say in this crazy world we're living in, don't be a jerk and don't forget to wear your mask. So everyone stay safe. Thank you to Derek, Leon, uh, Leon uh, Trevor and Harold for joining us today and, and, our, and Matthew as well as, as Jesse for sharing your knowledge on your programs. Be safe, everyone. Have Thank a good you. day. Thanks. Thank you.